Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our very first SALT Bible study. I'm Pastor Frank, youth pastor at Vernon Park Church of God, and I am so glad that you are here with us to, uh, to study God's Word as we dive into His Word today. On this weekend, we are celebrating what is the core of what we believe, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to talk about that resurrection and the hope that it brings us this morning. And so if you can turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to be looking at a letter written by the Apostle Paul. Now in this letter, Paul is addressing some issues that the Corinthian church was facing at that time. It was, it was a result of the fact that they were a pretty immature church. They were struggling with some moral issues, some factions. They had low tolerance for those who were immature in the faith and who was new to the faith. They just had a lot of things going on, and it pretty much sounds familiar to us today. They were also struggling with some ideas that they were surrounded with in their community and in their society. Their, their society had this idea of what we call today YOLO, you only live once. That idea that you just live, drink, be merry, do whatever you want, because after this life, that is it. And so Paul is addressing this letter. And so a few of those members of that church, I'll go back, uh, wrote a letter to Paul and asked him and inquired about some things. And so he is writing this letter in response to that letter. And so when we get to this portion of the letter, he is talking about a doctrinal issue, an issue that uh, they were having in the church in believing in the resurrection of the dead. And so Paul uh, begins to write here. And I believe that from this particular passage, we're going to be looking at the subject of resurrection hope. That's what we're looking at today. Well, what is hope? I believe hope is an important part of all of our lives, especially as believers. In fact, hope is, whether you believe in God or not, it's, it's, it's very important. Everyone should have hope for something. They should have a desire or goal or something that you are looking forward to, look, something that you are looking ahead for. It's something in the future, and it motivates you to take the steps uh, to make those things happen. I was reading an article in the American Psychology Association, and it said that uh, it was talking about children that, who grew up in poverty. And it talked about those children who grew up in poverty and then later on became successful in life all had one thing in common, and that was hope. There was a desire that they were striving for. And for the believer, we have more than just a want or a desire. We have a certainty that is grounded on the word of God, knowing that our God cannot lie. And I believe that this is passage teaches us some ideas about this resurrection hope. When we look at the first verse, it says, let me now remind you, dear brothers, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand in it now. Paul found it very important to remind him. All reminders have some level of importance. And I think that brings us to our first point. Hope is developed through reminders. What does it mean to remind? To remember something. To bring something to the attention of. It can be a necessary action or a commitment to be remembered. That's what it means to remind. And Paul wanted to remind them of something very important. And I believe our hope needs to be reminded, needs to have these reminders. It needs to be, sometimes we need to bring up memories back in our mind and commitments that we've made in our past and lessons that we've learned in our lives to help us get through seasons in our lives. Throughout the Bible, God often called people to build monuments and create reminders just so that they can remember what God had done. You remember the story of Joshua when he told, when God told Joshua and the people to take 12 huge stones and build it as a reminder to remember what God had done for them. A few weeks ago in our Sunday Bible study, we were talking about the prophet Habakkuk. And in that, where we hear that famous scripture, write the vision. Make it plain so that they may run who read it. They may run and not faint. That writing down, that vision, that tangible thing, it makes it tangible. It's a reminder to always go back and look to see what God has done. You know, every month, churches around the world, they celebrate what we call the Last Supper or Communion. And in that, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It's a reminder of what he did for us on the cross. 
And I believe the Bible, God's word, it's written, it's tangible. It's something to remind us to go back, to remember the commitments we made, to remember the lessons that God had taught us throughout our lives. And our hope is developed through that memory. And it grows, our, develop, our hope grows and it, and it grows more as we look back on things. Things in our past feed and nourish our future. Sometimes we have to look back and see what God has brought us from and it encourages us to make it through our current situations now because memory keeps you motivated. You know, um, during this time where we've been going through this COVID-19, um, I see, I've seen a lot of people, and we've done this on my job as well, where they'll be looking at old memories of pictures from vacations and old times in their lives as moments of encouragement. They look at those things to motivate them to say, you know what, I can get through this and I look forward to that vacation again. I know we all look forward to a vacation. And we look at those pictures to say, I can get through this moment and they can help me to get to the next moment. That's what it does in our lives. That, what, that is what reflection does. It takes us, uh, we, we go from our present time and look back and it helps us and feeds our future. One question I would like to ask you, are what are some of the things that you need to be reminded of? You know, there are some things that God has done for you in your life that you need to remember. And it, always, it is always a great time to sit back and reflect on things in your life. You know, there are some choices that you made that you remember that you need to remember in your life that you may not have remembered that you've done. There's some commitments that you made to God. There's some commitments that you made to yourself that you may have forgotten in your life. Have you taken the time to really sit down and reflect about memories and commitments and actions? I believe that God has given us this time to do that reflection. We have more time more than ever before now to really sit back and think about old situations and think about how I could have done those things differently. What, what is hindering me now that, uh, that, that possibly hindered me back then? And how can I change those things? I believe as God is calling us and pre to prepare us to take this time to reflect on some things. Uh, I believe that we can't afford to make the same decisions and the same choices and have the same attitudes or the same strategies that we did before. Reflection is a time to take those thoughts and to make some changes in your life without taking time to intentionally reflect and allow the Holy Spirit to show you your attitudes and the mindsets that are hindering you, you will continue to be hindered from stronger faith and stronger hope to receive the promises of God. This is what Paul was doing here. He was telling them it was, it's important to remember this stuff, to be reminded of this. Paul is reminding them that there was a good news that you believed before that you need to continue to believe in now. We go on to verse 2, and it says that, Paul says that, in this good news, you, you were saved, and you will be saved if you continue to believe this message that I told you. I believe this is the second point that tells about hope, that gives us an idea of what hope is for our life, and that is hope requires endurance. Paul gives us a conditional clause here. He says, if you continue to believe, it can save you. What is endurance? Endurance is the fact or power of enduring an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without giving way, without giving up. It's the ability to have strength, to continue to last, especially through fatigue, stress, or adverse conditions. It's the whole idea of stamina. And Paul is telling them that you need endurance. You need to continue to believe. You can't just stop believing in this. In order to be saved, you must continue. And I believe that many people who once believed in God and the power of Jesus now have walked away from the faith in many ways because they could not endure. And that hope that they once had could not survive the difficult times, could not survive the times of doubt and confusion. And so it caused many of them to walk away from faith in God. And I believe that hope requires endurance. Remember, the Corinthian church was dealing with a lot of stuff. They, they were dealing with uh, the very churchy, what I call, or religious people, just mistreating um, and misrepresenting God. They were mistreating the newcomers. They were, they were uh, 
uh, dealing with all kind of confusion in the church with the hypocrites and, and on top of that, all of these things going on in the church, on top of that, society told them that their faith was wrong. I believe that's the same as today. You know, we, we, we're being, people are telling us that we're being misled and, and, and that uh, we're being tricked into following a faith that is not real and believing in a Jesus that did not exist. And we're living our lives according to a book that's full of fairy tales. It's with that in mind and all of that going on, with you have to fight with society and all of those issues. Then you have issues inside the church where people talk about you and give you no room to make mistakes. It's hard for your faith to endure through all of that. But it's necessary. It's a part of life. Hope is necessary. And you need hope and you need that faith to endure. When you go back a few uh, in the previous chapters, Paul, in, at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says something very interesting. He says, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. He said they remain. They will always be there. And I believe that with that saying, nothing in life can be accomplished without one of these th three things, faith, hope, or love. You need all of them. There's nothing you can do. No accomplishment can be made, nothing, no goal that you can have. You can have a goal to uh, cut an album, write a book, have your own church, open up a business, whatever it is, you're going to need either faith, hope, and love. And to really be the church, you're going to need all three. You're going to need faith, hope, and love. So there, there's nothing that you can do in life. There's no relationship that you can build without faith, hope, or love. You have to have one of those. And the thing about it is all require endurance. They require persistence. They, re they require consistency. You'll give up in your dream. You'll give up on your dream quickly if you don't have endurance. You'll betray your spouse and your family if you lose faith. That's why we call it being unfaithful. You need that endurance. And why is endurance important in your life? Endurance is important because simply this, life will be life. No matter where you are or what you're going through, what season that you're in, there will always be something to tempt you to give up. It would tell you to give up on your success and it caused you to fail. It would tell you to give up. You know, it doesn't matter. You can be going through a great time in your life and some, that good time in your life will cause you to forget some things and cause you not to endure. But then you can go through some very difficult things in life and those, that difficulty will cause you to say, I want to give up. My question to you today again, is what areas in your life do you need to strengthen your endurance? And how, what, what can you do to, what can you do to really make sure that your help, that your hope does not fail? You may be asking this question, how do I build this endurance? How do I get this? Well, um, I think about it like this. I am also a, a track coach of a high school. And one of the things that I teach my team and that I know about it being a coach is that in order to run a race, in order, whether it's the 100, 400, 800 mile, whatever it is, you're going to need endurance. And you build that endurance through training. And during this time, you know, of course, we're not able to have our season at the moment. And so I, I've been contacting my athletes to make sure that they are still working out. Most likely they're not working out. I know that. But uh, I was talking to the captain of the team and we were having a conversation and she um, texted me and she said, you know, coach, I went out to run today and my chest hurts. And I was like, well, have you been working out during this time? And she was like, uh, no, not really. And I'm like, well, that's what happens when you don't continue to push, don't continue to build your endurance, you lose it. And that's what happens in our lives sometimes. We lose that endurance. We have to have training. We have to be trained. How do we go through training? Well, I believe that the word of God is like the weights that we need in our life. It's the equipment. It's the workout equipment that we need. And so we must read our word every day. We must pray and look at that word as at that training equipment. We must fast and pray. And I believe sometimes God will do like I did to my team and email you a text uh, or text you some type of workout routine. He'll send you through something that will keep you in the weight room to make you lift those weights, to exercise those spiritual muscles. And so we want to understand that your hope, even though that resurrection gave us hope, that God gives us hope, 
We must maintain it by enduring, by enduring and having endurance. Paul goes on in this chapter and he, we go to verse three and he says, I passed on to you what was most important and what was also passed on to me. Paul is saying something here very simple. He says, I'm giving you what I received first. I, 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 he, he encountered Jesus himself. He encountered uh, uh, this new life, if you will. He received it. He received this good news. He believed in it. And so he's passing it on and he's sharing it with other people. And I believe that it is often difficult, if not impossible, but definitely deceptive to try to preach something that you don't believe in yourself. And I think this brings us to our next point, that resurrection hope needs to be shared. We have to do the same thing that Paul did. We have to be able to share this story. Our hope is a certainty that we are expecting something to happen. Yes, it's difficult and it's not and impossible to preach something that you don't believe in, but you have to, you have to receive it first. You know, as I've been, been developing in, in, in the ministry and Learn some lessons throughout this time. I've, I've been taught by some great mentors, a pastor and, and Reverend Bennings, and I've heard along the way that the greatest sermons are the ones that you've experienced and that resonate with you the most because you've been through it and you've gone through it. This is what people need to hear. They need to hear your story. They need to hear the message of hope that God has given you. I think that ministry is most effective when you help someone who has been through the same things that you've been through, you know, you may be going through some sickness and God is helping you through your sickness or healed you through your sickness. They need to hear that story. Whether you're going through addiction or, or some type of issues like that, people need to hear your story. For me, it was insecurity and it has been insecurity. I, I know I've dealt with that all of my life and I found that oftentimes and I was joking about this with a, a co-worker very recently that oftentimes a lot of the young people who are dealing with insecurity and dealing with these thoughts of, of, of low self-esteem, they draw to me because, you know, those spirits kind of draw together. And, and I recognize that I can be able to tell them, you know, I've done this in my life. You know, I, I, I've sabotaged connecting with people in fear that uh, they wouldn't like something about me that I didn't like about myself. I was, I was worried that they wouldn't, you know, want to connect with me later. And, and so as God has healed me and, and continue to heal me through that insecurities, I'm able to share that with people. And you can do the same thing. You know, um, the Bible said it very simply in, in the book of uh, Revelation. He says that we are, they were overcome by the blood and by the word of the testimony. Just the word of your testimony, your, your testimony, your word, that sharing can help someone's life. It's important to share your story. And I ask you this reflection question because we are going through Bible study. How can I share hope that was given to me? In what ways can you do that? What ways can you share the hope that God has given you with other people? We go on to our next point that as Paul is going on here, he talks about, he says, I've shared this with you. And he talks about what he shared. He shared the good news. The good news is the word in Greek, eugalion. It's used by Old Testament authors to mean the announcement or the appearance of a, of a king, the ascension to the throne of a ruler. He said, I gave you this eugalion, good news. And what consists of this good news? I think it brings us to our next point that hope has been confirmed by the resurrection. Paul gives us three important components that goes with this announcement. He says, first of all, that Christ died just as the scripture said. We can see that in Isaiah chapter 53, that Jesus was not a victim of circumstances. He was not a victim of his consequence. He was an agent in God's plan. He was played an active role in it. That this was not something that just happened to him. He did not allow it to happen to him. He played a role in it because it was part of God's plan. You know, we see that in Isaiah 53 in the suffering servant. It went just as scripture said. And I think that that helps us to understand something in our lives. That we don't have to be victims of our circumstances. We don't have to be victims of where we come from or how much money we make or how much education we have. 
but we can take an active role in making choices and making decisions about our own lives. You know, there, um, you know, I, I, we hear it a lot of times now, you know, we see the numbers with what's going on with COVID-19, how it's affecting our community so much. And believe me, and I understand that there are a lot of systemic things that have caused this, but I believe that we have not taken agency in some things. You know, it's been suggested, stay in the house, you know, stay in so it won't spread. But we have so many people out playing basketball and going shopping and all these things and just doing these unwise things. But you have to be an agent. You have to make some choices. And so I believe that uh, this is what Christ teaches us in this. Um, the, so he, so he showed us first that he had to die. It was important. It had to go according to scripture, according to plan, that he had to die. But second, he said that he had to be buried. He had to be buried. It's important for the burial. This is an important part of the good news because burial was proof that you died. Bodies were prepared and, and you were wrapped in everything, and so it was proof that you died. And there are experts today, or quote-unquote experts, that say maybe Jesus didn't die. But the proof was the fact that he was buried. The third component that is most important and that's just as important, all three, is that he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as scripture had said. These three elements, you have to have all three of these. It was proof. He had to be, he had to die, he had to be buried, and he had to rise again. All of these play an equal part in this equation. Without the death, there would be no forgiveness of sins. We know that. Without the burial, there would, have been, there would have been room for people to be skeptical and say, well, maybe this is a sham. Maybe they're tricking us. Maybe he did not die. But most important, here's the thing. It was important for the resurrection to happen. This is, a, this is an element that, yes, we celebrate and we're celebrating it this weekend, but we don't realize how important it really was. Paul said later on in the scripture in verse 14, if Christ had not been raised, our preaching would have no power. It would be useless. It would be ineffective. He said our faith would be ineffective. In other words, the way that we live out our lives, the, uh, the way that we live out what we believe would be ineffective. It would have no power. There would have been no change happening. Nothing would have been accomplished. So he's saying that it was important to have this resurrection. But he also said in a very important thing, when he goes down to verse 17, he says the exact same thing almost. He says, if Christ had not been raised, your faith would have been futile. In other words, that word there means worthless, had no value, would have been empty. Uh, it would have nothing in it, uh, just like a car. If a car has no gas, it cannot move, it cannot go anywhere. So without gas, uh, no matter how pretty the car is and how well shine and clean it is, it can't go nowhere and it can't fulfill the purpose. And it's just like that with your faith. If you do not, if our lives... Uh, Paul says, does not have faith. It does not have full of, if, if Christ did not die, we would not have faith. We would not be full of faith. We would not be able to do things to take us to new places and go to new things through believing in God. That's what Paul was saying. And he said, Christ, if Christ had not died, you would not have had faith. But the important part he says here, he says, if he not, if he did not raise himself from the dead, you would still be guilty of your sins. Now, how does that work? How does the resurrection do this? Because I thought that the blood is what saved us from the sins. But here's the interesting part. Paul is showing us that if the resurrection never happened, then we would never have been healed by his wounds because it would have had no significance. We would have no peace uh, because of the punishment that he received. It wouldn't have meant anything. Um, there would have been no power in his blood because he would have just been another human. The resurrection proved and sealed the fact that he was a victorious king and not a defeated man, that he was the Messiah. And because of that, we know now that his blood does have power. We need that resurrection. Paul is showing us that that resurrection shows you that God, that Jesus is king, that he can bring you back from despair, bring you back from low places and bring you back from depression and addiction and all those things that hinder us. The, that, that Jesus was that resurrected king. And I like what the songwriter says, that the resurrected king is resurrecting me, that he does have the power to resurrect us from the low places. Paul is showing us very simply that if Christ had not died, we would still, he had not died and he had not risen, 
we would still be in our sin. Last part, because there's so much to this, but the last part we go into, verse 21, Paul now begins to talk about this whole idea of the resurrection of the dead and what it meant for us and, and what does Christ's resurrection have to do with that. And Paul is arguing that the resurrection of the dead is possible because of the resurrection of Christ. Starting in verse 21, he says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. This brings me to my very last point, that resurrection hope extends beyond the grave. That's what the hope did. That's what the resurrection did for us. It gave us a hope that extends beyond the grave. As I showed here, Paul said that from one man came sin and death, and from another man, Jesus Christ, came the resurrection. That in Adam all die, and in Christ all are made alive. You remember back in Genesis chapter 2, God told Adam, God told Adam this one thing. He said, if you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. That concept, that idea of die just means separation. And many argue whether it was a physical separation or, or a spiritual one. But I believe that it had components of both. He told him, if you eat of this, you will surely die. And what happened was, we know Adam ate the fruit. And then from that moment, what happened? God then removed him. From the garden. He was separated from that relate from that, that closeness with God that he had. And not only was he removed, but the garden was therefore blocked, allowing no more access to it, that no one can go in like that, that there would be a, never be another time where we could be as close to God as Adam was. It was a dying moment, that concept, it was separating us from God, but it was also separating us eternally from him. And we would never be in the presence of God like that. Again, Adam opened the door to sin and Paul says, even in verse 57, he said, the sting of death is sin. So when Adam sinned and he disobeyed God, he gave sin the power. He gave sin the power to not just separate us from God, but separate us from God eternally. That's what it did. It separated us from God eternally. Adam's choice had a ripple effect throughout history. It separated us from God eternally. But then Paul goes on to say, but, the, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How did he do that? Jesus, when he died, he conquered death. He conquered death so that now we, we can not only be saved from our sin, which give us victory, put us back into relationship with God. It puts us back into relationship with him. But it also opens the door so that we do not have to be separated from God eternally. When, 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 when Adam did it, it separated us from God and it separated us from eternally. That's what sin did. But when Christ conquered all of that, when Christ died and he resurrected, it allowed us to have relationship with God eternally, beyond the grave. That's why we say we have power from the resurrection. That's why the words, are, that's why the Bible says when you are absent from the body, you are present with the Lord because Jesus opened the door for access to be present with God beyond the grave. And so today I want to encourage you to know that we have a hope, a hope that Christ has given us. He bled, he died, he was buried, but most importantly, he rose again and he resurrected us in our lives today. And I want to pray with you because you may have been experiencing loss in your life. You may have experienced some tough moments. We all are going through a tough moment right now and we are in need of some hope. Maybe you have lost a loved one during this time. But as I said, it's important to know that this important hope that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That God and Christ has, Christ's resurrection has opened up that door for us to have presence with God eternally. Let me just pray with you now. Father, we thank you for the hope that you have given us, O oh Lord. We thank you, O oh God, that you gave your life to forgive our sins. You gave your life to give us new life. But more importantly, God, you proved to the world who you were when you rose again, O oh God. And we would still be in our sins if it were not the fact that you rose again. 
So, Father, we pray, oh God, that someone's hope is going to be restored today, oh God, that you restore hope. Remind us, oh God, thank you for reminding us, oh God, that you bled, you died, but you rose again, oh God. Help us to endure, oh God, so that our faith can stand and our hope can stand strong, Lord. We pray, oh God, that we recognize this resurrection and the power that it gave in our lives so that we can understand that in this life and this life after this, we can always be in presence with you, that we have nothing to be afraid of because we are always with you in this life and after. And we thank you for this hope. And we pray, oh God, that you just continue to help us and be with us during this time. Bring comfort to those who are experiencing loss at this moment, oh God. And we pray that you just, your love surrounds each one of them, oh God. And we thank you for this hope. And we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.